This is Charlie Flow World Sports Show. I'm joined by y'all, Avery Bush on World Sports Show. I want to thank you all for calling another show. Of course, my pleasure. So everything in this world is going crazy right now, but we're going to talk about your career, what you've done kind of post-football. With right now, it's Techni Football, this app that players can use from home. It's is, is, is gotten huge. I've had my WPSL team using it for a year and a half. We're in our second season. just want to go back to like where the idea came to start and how you're doing this. Yeah, so really, um, as an active professional player, I was very passionate about uh, sharing training ideas in whatever way I could. And it started off on YouTube, uh, then then social media, and really, I, I felt that there was a desire for um, training ideas and challenges and things that players could do on their own and and do creatively with minimal space and equipment. So had the idea to kind of develop something more substantial and definitely had no idea what I was getting into when I decided to launch a business as an active pro player. So that was about three and a half years ago and really um, just launched a very simple first version to see if people uh, wanted what I had in mind, which is, and the core of it is a new training session each week. So it takes players through what to do, kind of like the blueprint of the ideas to train on their own, and then ways to track their progress and compete with others on leaderboards. So that was kind of like the core of the idea from the beginning. And we got very positive feedback from that first version. So literally have a day has not gone by that we haven't worked on, you know, the training content and the product since that point. Yeah, I think it's great because, you know, as I'm a former college coach, now coach WPSL, and then I got several club teams and you've been at every level that you remember those coaches that would tell you, all right, I want you to go home and work 20, 30 minutes on ball. And it was based on honor code. I, I think that this is a great way with this app that I, I get my email from you guys every week and I, I get the minutes that every player used. And it it's, goes beyond the honor code because it creates that competitive nature that I love doing individual workouts myself as a coach and signing it, but you want to see the players and they strive to be that number one. Yeah, I mean, it adds the idea of the accountability piece, I think, and that's, it's about the soccer skills, but it's also about like helping players to develop the discipline, the consistency, the accountability, and for them to literally see uh, their work adding up over time, I think is really powerful. You know, it's something that I always had the understanding as a player, but to see it visually, like literally see your minutes getting logged is kind of a nice reward because you can see it add up and, and be rewarded for that when your coach sees it as well. And even have the different levels, you know, different rewards you guys send the players, you know, that I think that we're in a day and age where social media is so big and, and people love, and especially in a day and age where we are now, is, is having something to achieve. And, 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 you know, this is now the trophies that players can win right now. Yeah, it's true. It's, I mean, being able to acknowledge our players who are working hard, I think, is one of the most fun parts of, of technique football, I think, is seeing clubs post their lists of players of who's training the most, seeing our players get to their new uh, training sock levels and, and post a picture with their new socks they got in the mail. You know, it's a, a nice way for people to be acknowledged for, for something really positive and good, which is the hard work they did when no one was watching. And I think it goes to just the generation that, that you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than you. Um, you're, you're still very young in my book that we now have like every single player out there almost from gosh even my U9 players have phones have the internet at their at their fingertips so the, the fact that you've made this so easy to access and get it just makes it I guess almost a no-brainer for for anybody saying well I don't have access to it because you guys put yourself on so many different platforms yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm not I'm not that young because when I was coming up through, I definitely did not have a phone. And I remember actually going to college with my flip phone. And I had this memory the other day of when uh, I, I I didn't have unlimited text messages. And it was a big thing of like, oh, I need to get unlimited text messages, which like now is not even a thing somebody's heard of because like everyone has has that. But um, but yeah, it's true. It's like everybody has access now to, to smartphones for the most part. And um, so rather than, you know, scrolling through Instagram all day, can you spend, well, actually, you know what, still throw, scroll through Instagram if you enjoy it, but can you spend 15 of those minutes also yeah. working on your ball skills using your phone? And that's what I think is important for players to realize it's nothing crazy, but 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day over time really does add up and has a huge impact on your, uh, your playing. So I think that's, those are the kind of habits we're trying to encourage. Yeah, the same thing with my players. I try to try to at the minimum get 15, 20 minutes a day. I know that everybody's in a challenging situation. I think that's the great part about your app that, you know, every single player is going through, you know, situations now and just in life in general. So 
your app set up. If I got a small living room space, you know, I'm, I'm sure the neat part about you is seeing all the different spaces that players at all levels are to their advantage at this time. Yeah. And I think part of it is that, is that creativity. You know, I grew up in New Jersey and winters were a time where we had to be creative. So literally things you can do in your living room in a three by three area, you clear out in your basement, um, you know, in a, in a backyard, a driveway, garage, whatever it is. And, and players are really uh, starting to get creative. And I think that's, that's a huge thing too, is it's the thought process to find the space and find the things you can do rather than think, think of all the things you can't. Cause you know, right now it's a very difficult time with a lot of restrictions, but there are still things you can do as a player uh, that will make you significantly better. And those are, you know, those are the things we want the players to focus on. And I'm sure this, this past convention, you know, you had a lot of success. I, I saw you at the convention in Baltimore constantly meeting with people. It, it's becoming more of a household name that the clubs are, are jumping on and, and getting involved even from like the high level to the low level. Yeah, you know, yeah, I did have a lot of meetings uh, at the coaches convention. I, when you said that, I kind of had a little PTSD of like sitting in those <laughs> meetings all day. But, you know, it's great, too. It's, it's a really cool thing to interact with these clubs from all around the country and to kind of hear what their unique and individual challenges are and really when we form our club or team partnerships we we actually form a partnership like we want to understand who are the athletes who are these families what mindset are they coming from what are their goals what are the goals of the club and then how can we help to support that and make individual training part of the culture that's already going on there and i think it's a cultural shift is that we're looking to make with these clubs it's not just right now when players can only play on their own it's all the time and past this time and, and, and training on your own should be a huge part of what you do as a player in our youth soccer landscape and quite frankly it's not right now but that's kind of the cultural shift we're looking to make I mean it goes back to the whole thing of like you know I'm very fortunate that I grew up with you know the formal side of, of soccer and then sometimes you know my coaches would probably be pissed at me when I'd get home from, from formal training, I'd go play pickup soccer with the kids in the neighborhood that just weren't interested in playing like club type of soccer. And I think that's something that, you know, that your app inspires those kids to just go work on their own, go do their own individual moves. So there's something cool about a coach not watching. You know, I want my players to go do their stuff, but just kind of do it with nobody watching you. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that there's there's some things you can only learn on your own time. You can never do enough repetition of striking the ball to possibly learn in front of a coach. Um, and also, like, there's some things you just need to make a fool of yourself, make a mistake, like, go through that process that, like, maybe it's your weaker foot and you're not going to use it in, in a passing pattern in training with your team because you know it might not be good enough. Well, like, that's why you have a wall to go and do, like, 100 of them so that when you show up with your passing pattern with your team, you feel like, okay, I can use my left foot when the coach asks. But just I think that's a natural part of anything is, like, there, there has to be this free um, area to make mistakes and to experiment with things and to figure things out. And that just cannot possibly happen when you're with a group. Now, let's just look at some of your career. You know, you, you've, you've been very fortunate to play at every level, you know, the U.S. level starting E16 all the way to the – Senior women's national team, you've, you've played pro and the WPS all the way to the NWSL. Um, so you've played in all. What were some of the, I guess, bigger challenges for you that, you know, you kind of maybe said, hey, what, what if I had technology back then? Yeah, you know, I think for me, a lot of, a lot of it was, um, I think I actually, it's funny, when you talk about like the, the range of, um, of what players are doing from everything from being super comfortable in your comfort zone and just showing up at training to like pushing yourself so far outside your comfort zone. I think I overdid it like a little bit outside my comfort zone. So I think for me, it would have been nice to have technology to understand like what players everywhere were doing. And I always had this huge fear. And I remember this is literally what the leaderboards in Techni are based off of. I had this huge fear that like whatever I was doing, there was somebody out there in Texas or California or Ohio or something doing like something I had never seen. They were so good and training so much more than me. So it caused me this kind of like, it wasn't a serious anxiety, but I always, I always had this kind of underlying fear that I think nowadays with like video and the kind of, you know, tracking that players have and like in technique with our leaderboards, players have a pretty good idea of what everyone's doing. And then you can be competitive about it in a good like healthy way, but certainly technology has made our soccer world even smaller. You know, it's already a small world, but technology allows us to connect in a way that um, I, I felt isolated as a young player throughout my career and kind of was always wondering like, what are other people doing out there? So what was that like when you, you, you get started inviting into these national team camps all the way from 16, 17, even the senior team, was that some of that anxiety still there? You're like, oh my gosh, I'm working out with a national team, you know? 
Well, yeah, I think it actually, that really, um, that really helped because I finally like could see what was out there. And I think for me, a strength of mine has been like, I'm not always, I've not always been the best player in every environment I've been in. And I'm not always, you know, uh, the coach's favorite or anything like that, but I was able to adapt very quickly and like figure out how to be successful in different environments. So for me, I would get into those environments and I was really fortunate to have the opportunity. And then I could kind of quickly assess and be like, wow, there are some players out there who are really good at heading. And that wasn't something I grew up like working on a lot. Like, okay, I need to go home and I need to attend to this or like, whoa, I'm not one of the faster players, you know, at the, at the, you know, I might be fast for my club team right now, but when it comes to like the national level, you know, I'm very, very average or below average. And so those were really um, helpful comparisons for me. And that's when I kind of could kind of relax and at least see where I stood and you have that honest feedback available then. Yeah, I mean, you you played your college ball, UNC, went on having a pro career in the WPS and some in Europe and then NWSL. What, what were some of the players around you that probably lifted your game up? If you think at UNC, what, what are some of the players you can name that, hey, man, this player, she really helped push me to where I am now? Oh, gosh. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't one who didn't. Um, <laughs> I think that was a really cool thing about UNC. You talk about being competitive and every player being like at the top of whatever they do is that UNC was like cutthroat in terms of that I mean I'm just thinking of the players I got to play with my freshman year it was uh Lori Kolupny, Lindsay Tarpley, Heather O'Reilly it was literally like a, a national team lineup yeah, that, was that, the feed, that was the feeder team for the national team you know that was the oh yeah national team. <laughs> yeah no I, I mean so I was with the best of the best my entire college career and then and then uh Tobin Heath, Casey Nagara, um now now Lloyd Nikki Washington, all, Megan Klingenberg all started to come in. And, and so really um, my four years there, I played with some of the best players uh, I think ever to have represented our country or to be in the pro ranks. So in every way possible in terms of training intensity, uh, speed of play, technical ability, like there was in every aspect of the game, there was somebody who was probably legitimately the best top five in the country, uh, you know, literally on my team. So uh, I definitely benefited from being up against the best of the best every day in training. Yeah, I'm sure that those training sessions, you know, just that UNC were intense, that you look at that roster and the players you named, that there's none of that. All right, I can slack off a little bit. I got my spot in 11. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, never, never quite felt like that. No, and then let's, let's look into the transition, just, just, you know, going through college and then I believe it was 2007 you made your, your senior team debut on the national team. You know, what's that experience like just, you know, stepping on the field, being on the national team? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the ultimate dream. Uh, that was always my number one goal. And I think for me, um, it was almost that, that first time. I almost don't even remember the game. I was so nervous. I literally could barely, I could barely run on the field because I couldn't even feel my legs. Um, cause there was just so much, like my entire childhood was like basically f waiting for that one moment. Um, but you know, it's interesting. It's like anything else is that I, I was really grateful and so excited to get that first cap. And then it certainly was not a smooth road from that point on, you know, I never really established myself as like a core part of the team as I would have hoped to. And it was always an ongoing tryout process, which it really is at that level. Um, and I think you know, that's how I felt in my pro career as well. It's like, wow, I'm a pro. This was my goal. But really, I think what it's important for players out there to realize and coaches to remind players is that you never hit smooth sailing. You know, it's always the same ups and downs and it actually only gets harder and, and there's more pressure and the margin of victory versus defeat is even smaller when you get to those high, high levels. Yeah, and that's the thing about like being a professional athlete that the harder you work, every year going forward, you get a year older and every new player is a year younger than you or, or younger. And it's just, a, it really pushes some of the veterans that we've seen in this league that I don't know if some of these veterans are still playing in their late thirties. It just blows my mind. Yeah, no, it's something to be said for that. I think, you know, I've started to, the older I get, the more I really appreciate longevity in a professional uh, sports career. I think uh, it's, it's really cool to be a star player for a year or two, or win a championship, but the players who do this for, you know, over 10 years, 15 years of a professional career at the highest level of the game is just unbelievable. And I mean, in Kansas City, I mean, those those are some years you get to win some championships under Vlaco. You know, what was that just emotion feeling like, you know, hearing him be announced as our new women's head coach? 
Yeah, I mean, it's no secret. I'm a huge fan of Vlaco. He, he was uh, playing for Kansas City. That was my favorite professional team I was on. Vlaco was uh, by far the best coach I had as a professional player. And I just have so much respect for him because everything that we as players put into what we do, Vlaco does the same on the coaching end. He deeply cares about his team as people, as athletes. Uh, he is so thorough when it comes to tactics and preparation. I think he's more nervous on game day than any of the players. <laughs> um, and so for me, you know, I love to see when good, hardworking people are rewarded for that and recognized. And so, um, you know, I've never been more nervous to watch national team games <laughs> than, than when Vlaco's coaching because I just want him to succeed so badly. Well, it was good seeing him wear his emotions on his sleeve when, when, when the U.S. qualified for the Olympics. I'm sure that was just like almost all of us pumped our fists seeing how happy and emotional he was. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm sure that was, you know, for a coach coming in in that situation, I'm sure that's like constantly riding on you till you get that, you know, <laughs> that moment out of the way, because that's a, a huge pressure situation coming into the job with not much time to prepare. Well, y'all, I want to want to thank you for joining me and taking the time out of your day from your family and everything you've got going on in your life. And appreciate everything you do for the game and even the women's game and all your work with the NWSL Players Association. I cannot thank you enough for everything you do for our game. Oh, thank you for saying that. It's really kind. I appreciate this and uh, enjoyed the conversation. All right. Thank you so much. This is Charles Flow World Sports Show here with Daniel Klitnovich joining me here on World Sports Show. Daniel, I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on the show. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So you've had a lot going on in your life. You know, just recently it was announced that you'll be working with FC Bucks. I mean, that's a household, like, really, really well-known club here in the Philadelphia area. How did you get connected with them? And tell us a little bit how you started up working with them. Uh, it's, uh, obviously, you're right. The, the, the brand, it's, we've, every, everyone knows about FC Bucks, whether it be uh, 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 people in California or people on the East Coast. It's a, it's a national brand, and, and ultimately um, – it, it, it happened out of nowhere, to be very, very honest with you. Uh, uh, happened quick and, and, and happened uh, uh, because of, uh, uh, obviously, Chris McLean took the role there. Chris being um, someone who I've known for a while. He's the head coach, obviously, at Villanova. Uh, before that, associate head coach at uh, The Ohio State University. Uh, uh, great college coach, uh, a great youth uh, a trainer. Um, and you know he's, he's he's ran clubs himself, so he had an opportunity to take that role. And um, you know he he just out of nowhere uh, came to me and just just said, let's let's do this, let's get these guys back to where they belong. And um, to be to be quite honest with you, I, I said no right away. I I, I wasn't ready for it, and um, you know doing other things kept keeping me busy. Uh, um, and 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 ultimately, you know he 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 proposed some some great ideas, and and they're all attainable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be back at the ECNL. It's great to be back with the, some of the best players in the country, whether we're playing against them or, 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 or you've got them in your team if you can do that. But some of the coaches are going to come up. It's going to be great. The clubs, it's, it's, it's going to be back there again. Absolutely. No, no, it's like you've said, it's about a nationally known club. They do well, and it's great at set up there. It's, it's a little bit up past, you know, Northeast Philly, for those listening to World Sports Show. Bucks County sits northeast of – Philadelphia so you, you still can dip in to get some of those Philadelphia players because you know northeast Philadelphia is an area that has a lot of really good soccer players so you, you can draw that players in too yeah look to be honest with you we're situated in a place where this there's already um whether it be the conference itself uh, you've got uh, a PDA in there and you've got some 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 good clubs in that region that uh, um, you know, ultimately the New Jersey players, the Philadelphia kids, uh, um, you know, it, it's a club that should be doing well. And, and, and in, in the past they have, I'm not going to say that they haven't recently, but they could definitely be, uh, be doing a little bit better. So, yeah, it, it, it's a big job, to be honest with you, but uh, I'm excited. You get to see a Chris a lot, man. So, obviously, you guys have to have a really good relationship. Too much. No, listen, Chris is, Chris is a guy who, those of you that don't know him, um, he's pleasant. He's pleasant. And, you know, you can go to him and, 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 and say things to him that you, you disagree with. And um, he'll listen to you or he won't. And, and, and that's okay. It's how you, 
how you, you know, you, you, you deal with it. And, you know, him and I have had a good relationship everywhere we've been and uh, we've, we've done our well, well together. He, he, he knows my strengths. I know his, he knows my weaknesses. I know his. And so far, you know, um, things are going well. Yeah. I think the neat part about the coaching careers, you know, you've been coaching for a while, I've been coaching for a while. And so is Chris that, you know, every problem you have with a college, you wear a different hat, you know, you have to, and, and we're all used to wearing either we're an assistant head coach or goalkeeper coach. It seems like you've worn all his hats too. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know. And, and, you know, just Chris now leaving to go to FC Bucks, I was, I was his director at Lowell Marion Soccer Club. He had a, a U15 group there, very, very talented. When I bring up the club Lowell Marion, it's obviously uh, uh, probably a no-name club for the uh, elite soccer in this country but it's uh it's 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 a pretty stable club on the main line uh for you know uh, a certain uh, level of player but chris chris came over with a very talented group and um you know i was his director there so no it's 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 uh, it's good and now obviously chris has uh taken on this other role role here with uh, fc bucks and it's where he belongs um so no we're, we're excited we, we don't wear hats i'm going to be honest with you charlie yeah, you know, we, we we don't wear hats. Um, <laughs> he 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 gives me enough rope, and, and 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 I give him rope. We have to. It's it's called friendship. But um, we don't wear hats. Uh, I know my boundaries. I'll be very honest with you. I have to. Um, he knows his to an extent, and uh, we try our best. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I guess what I was more hinting at is that I think the interesting part about neat part about coaching is all the different roles. I guess we can have and and the adjustments of you know what you're working on today, what you're working on. And some people ask me, like, what's your favorite for coaching? And I think each one has its pros and cons. And, and each one, sometimes I love just sitting on the bench being an assistant coach. You know, you can sit with your players, interact yeah. with them, and not worry so Absolutely. much about all the subs. No, you, 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 you're right. And, and I've learned personally my biggest lessons. And, and it's funny, people say, oh, you're going to learn when, when you're in charge. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I I've learned from, from, from Aaron Lyons at The Flash a lot. Um, I've learned from Charlie Nano and, and other things. And, and uh, you know, Charlie being uh, someone who's, who's, who's renowned in the soccer community all over the country and the world, quite frankly. And, and obviously even, you know, Chris McLean, he's, it, it, it's great being um, second in charge, not because they're failing or anything, not because of failure on their end, but more so being in the background. You probably don't feel as much stress. I don't know. It's just... Um, being second in charge or being, um, you know, where, where you're not as responsible on paper, um, it gives you that opportunity to, to maybe absorb more. I don't know. Because in my experience, when I was in charge, um, I didn't learn as much as I've learned not being in charge. So, um, yeah, no, I agree with you. No, it's true. There's different kinds of pressures when you're the head coach. You almost have to take the blame of a loss. And then when you're assistant coach, not that we're pointing fingers, but it's true. I, I feel so guilty when I'm the head coach, like what, you what, know that as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. You, and, you, you've experienced it. And, and let the record show, I mean, you did play each other or coach against each other this past winter. So I believe that was a four, one win for you guys, but it, it, it is interesting, you know, the, the going back and forth and just the, what a lot of people that aren't in the coaching world realize there's a lot of aspects that are out of our control, you know, uh, without a doubt, <laughs> without a doubt. And it's, it's such a fluid game where, I, I think coaching soccer is much different than a lot of the other American sports where you can call a timeout, bring your players over, sub them in, sub them out. It's just a, it's a free-flowing game. And I think that's why I like coaching it the most. Yeah, no, Charlie, I agree. If, if, if we don't prepare before you even start the game, then you've, you've really got little chance of changing anything during the game, in my opinion. Obviously, even at the highest levels, you can change things, but you're dealing with a different player, right? Different, more experience, the ability to change. But for youth soccer... If you haven't done your homework or if you haven't set things up beforehand, before that game started, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think you can do much during the game, to be honest with you. Um, and we do see a lot of coaches that try very hard <laughs> to do things. And it's sometimes you just realize you just got to ride the game out, you know. And sometimes letting – I think a lot of message I tell the parents is, is me by, by not talking as much. I'm not, not coaching. It's just you're letting the players just breathe and feel the game. Well, well just you, you bring, bring that game when we, we, we played against each other. And – just you and I, I, I know we were quiet. Like, I, I know we didn't, uh, we, we weren't there to um, change someone's life. Yeah. <laughs> in that one moment, whether they uh, received the ball well and, and, and they lost it or turned it over. So I, I, I agree with you. Like, your demeanor as well. You, you let them play and when, when, when you can talk to them when they come off, great. 
but dur- during the game itself, it's uh, it's tough to change. You know, it's yeah. just it's the prep beforehand that matters. Let's let's take a little uh, page back. You, you you were playing some pro soccer in Europe, a little bit of England and Australia. How did you get into to playing professional soccer? I mean, obviously, you had to have a youth career. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I had a youth career that was uh, okay. And when I say okay, I mean I was a right back and a left back. Uh, uh, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm, what I'm referring to is I never played that as a professional player. I was uh, a midfielder. But uh, to, to, to be honest with you, I, I, I never made David Beckham's money. It was uh, um, a, a, a good professional career. I was able to, to, to experience uh, uh, amazing cultures, and make amazing lifestyles, uh, um, you know, a professional player. Uh, but, you know, I started off to be very honest with you. I'll never forget the moment. I think I was, I was talking to my dad about this probably three days ago. No word of a lie. Um, I was maybe 14. Um, there was a referee that was refereeing the game. At the end of the game, it was a, a, the game that we were playing in was a, um, a state-level type game where, um, you know, it's like the state of, I was representing the U14s of, of, of PA against, the U14s of New Jersey, for example. Um, and I was playing for this for like a state team, um, high, high level for youth. And uh, at the end of the game, the referee, the referee approached my father uh, and, and, and said to him, you know, in the bar, because Australia is a little bit different to American youth soccer. Um, it's more based on European models where the youth club uh, has seniors and it, it goes all the way. When I say seniors, I mean men. Yeah, uh, yeah, the highest and, level for your club. Yep, yeah, and women. And then it trickles all the way down to eight-year-olds. So the eight-year-olds in the club uh, go and watch the, the men's game on a Saturday or, or the women's game on a Saturday. So uh, at the end of this game, I remember got my, my, uh, finishing the game, I was showering, whatever, and going up to the, um, you know, the bar or the restaurant of the club. And the referee was there talking to my dad and just telling him, like, you know, uh, you should try and get Daniel to, you know, start looking at agents and things like that. I was 14. And to be honest with you, it, it, it really just started at that point. And I wasn't the only one. There's, there's so many players that were better than me that, that never made it. And then there were so many average players that played with me, uh, uh, that, that, that played for Rangers or played in the Premier League. I don't want to name them specifically, but yeah. I think I gave that one away. Yeah. But, uh, you know, ultimately had unbelievable careers and, and, and they become great players, you know. So ultimately it's it's the chance you get and how you take it and the decisions you make. Um, I, I, I made some good ones. I, I know definitely I made some bad ones and that's just part of growing up, you know. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people, if anybody's willing to, to give you money to play a sport, you know, it's like that's a tumbling, you know, no matter what league it is, you know, yeah. they're – so many kids that just try and try and try. And I think that's their focus is, is looking to go pro to try to get paid and just play and enjoy it. And if that call comes, it comes. If not, that, you know, me and you are old guys right now. And I still love to kick the ball around. I'm not getting paid for it, but it's like you don't lose that love. But you just, if somebody calls you, then you take it. You, you, you're absolutely right. But the, there's one big thing that I've, I've told numerous players in my last, you know, five, six years, whether it be female or male, mainly the male because I can relate to them because I was being there. The women's game is still in a different landscape as far as I'm concerned. It's still developing. It's still doing well. It's getting better. But from, a, from, from, from my game and my experience talking to, you know, whether it be some of the, the Rapids youth players I, I got to know um, uh, and, 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 and so on. And a lot, of, a lot of the conversations I had was, it was tough. And, and when I say tough, I, like I said to you, I want to reiterate, I, I was never – um, uh, an A grade professional, how, how, how you rate them in ranking. I was, I was a B or C grade. And when I refer to that, I, I wasn't in the Premier League. I wasn't good enough. Um, I wasn't in Serie A. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't in the, uh, you know, uh, La Liga. I wasn't good enough. But the next tier and, 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 and it, or, or around that tier, yeah, I, I held my own. I was around there. But it was, it was tough. It was many times I wanted to give up. Many times... Um, I, 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 just like now you look at the college players I coach and a lot of them that tell me, um, you know, uh, I'm struggling with confidence and I know what that means. I, and I know how important that is because I remember when I struggled with confidence and I failed because I didn't have confidence. Um, and, and, and I was successful when I had confidence. It was like a, it was like a drug when you're yeah. confident. You, you, you're able to perform at a, a superior level. 
So what I mean by that is I, I, I genuinely believe that being a professional athlete um, in soccer mainly, I don't know any other sports, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And I can only imagine the, the further up you go, um, even, even, even more difficult. And unless you're mature and you're able to really make good decisions and have a good head on your shoulders, I, I don't think it's possible. I really don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at Australia as similar to the U.S. as in we have, you know, other sports that kind of take precedence, you know, like NFL and NBA. So big, like all rules down to rugby and other big things down there. So just it's it's hard to – I'm sure that you had to deal with that a little bit, being a little bit of an outsider when you're in Europe, you know. You're, you're coming – Without a doubt. Yeah, no, I, I – it's funny you, you say that because obviously we didn't even plan this chat, but I felt like that in, in almost every country uh, uh, except England obviously being a, a similar country in, in cultures, in a sense. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely experienced that in Romania, uh, without a doubt. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to uh, speak on anything too specific, but um, it was tough there from that perspective. It was, um, it was, I, I was also lucky. I had a coach there that played for PSV Eindhoven, Champions League games, played World Cup 94, former player for Romania. Um, I'm still in touch with him now, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, his name is uh, 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 Vidu Stinger. Um, he he played in the uh, played for Salamanca. Played, I think, a hundred caps for PSV Eindhoven when when they were really good. He, he's, he's you know teammates with Philip Koku, teammates with you know that type of player. It was, it was an unbelievable player, and he was my manager in Romania, so he he understood uh, foreigners and. The players didn't. The players were, were maybe envious a little bit, to be honest with you. Um, but also, you know, maybe me coming into that culture, I was too young to um, um, understand it, uh, as well as want to, you know, assimilate a little bit. You know, you know, when you're young, you're a little bit uh, maybe overconfident. You think it's it's um, the world revolves not around you, but close to it. So, ha had I had my head now, uh, 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 everything would be obviously a little bit different. Yeah, you read my mind. I say the same thing, man. If I could have the body of 30 years ago or 20 years ago and the brain you have, and, yeah. and, you, and you see those players, those are, those are the players that are far and few. Like I, one of the names that comes to mind, like a Del Piero, you know, a guy that, oh, I can run like 15 yards in this game, but have so much impact in that little circle that I'm running and how I'm distributed because they just, it's that, I talk to players about foreshadowing, they see things before they happen. You know, yeah. there's that a level above that you and I can coach and coach and train. But that certain kind of player, it's just it's a gem. I, I, I look at Carly Lloyd. I, I remember Carly Lloyd, uh, Charlie, when she first started. She's the same player that she is today. And what yep. I mean by that is, don't get me wrong, she would, she'd probably say a different story because she's better. She was good then and, I, and she's still good now. But what I'm referring to is just the way she was mature and uh, the way she uh, performed and... and I, I don't remember a young Carly Lloyd. When I refer, what I mean by that is she was obviously was younger. I get that, but I, I'm more referring to she was always she always played like an experienced player, and that's because she had that maturity level and she had that confidence, and she, you know, that's that's why she got where she was and she still is, to be very honest with you. And um, no, that, that's another prime example on the women's side, you know. Yeah. Um, speaking of the women's game, let's talk about how you got, you, you were with the flash in 2015. That was, um, you know, we saw the women's game, you know, kind of like in Australia, kind of ups and downs, you know, with the folding of the WPS years ago. And now it seems like the W, I mean, NWSL is here to stay. You know, what was that, that season like? Cause you got to coach some very talented players on that flash team. Yeah, no, I, 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 when I, when, when I joined the, the flash, it was definitely an aspiration of mine, but it all, it all happened through, again, through. Just people, people that have given me an opportunity, and, I, and I'm forever grateful for that. And they continue to do that in other areas. But um, the Flash experience was a good one. I know it was a tough season. I know that um, that that specific team, when I was there in '15, it was not the Flash of you know um, uh, championship wins. Um, but at the same time, we had unbelievable players, and you know, for me, it was a great uh, growing um, season. Um, you know, learning from Aaron a lot. Aaron being a uh, again, a high-level pro as a player, and then coaching some some unbelievable players. But to to, to be honest with you, joining the Flash. The reason I'm, I want to go back a little bit, if that's okay, is sure. I, I got to the Flash really because of, of Charlie Namo, and and ultimately Ch Charlie is someone I, I know you know him as well. Someone who I met when so when the the pro league, the WPSL, 
um, the WPS folder, my, my apologies. Um, and then the, the 2012 season, there was no pro league um, in the US. There was the uh, W League and then there was the WPSL. Uh, yeah, I remember that. They, they, they uh, created the second, yeah, Jerry yeah. created the second league to kind of help out, you know, yes. a place to play. So, so we had in our league, the W League, we had Alex Morgan, Rapino. We had, you know, they played for the Seattle Sounders. And, um, you know, Charlie had other players at the Pally Blues. That's where he was coaching. And um, uh, Michelle French was at Seattle Sounders. Um, but uh, anyway, long story short, uh, it was me getting to know Charlie um, and, 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 and never winning a game against him, ever. Uh, you know, over, over four seasons, I think. Uh, initially, it was five zero six zero losses to where by my fourth year, um, you know, we, we lost to them in the championship game, Western Conference, um, in, in 2012, I think it was, when there was no pro league, to the, the Pally Blues, and they were stacked. They had Sam Ewis, Abby Dolkemper, uh, Sarah Killian, I got Elizabeth Eddy. I could keep going, man. It's yeah. like... Okay, the players ended up on the flash too, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so really, that's where it started. I kept that going and you know, when, when the Flash were looking to, to reshuffle, Charlie was hired by them. And then, uh, you know, there was two, two parts to that. And, and Aaron was starting the, the Western New York Flash Academy. Uh, and that was a youth club uh, that was going to be hopefully ECNL. And now they are. Uh, but when I got there through my director experience, I was also a director of coaching in Colorado, co coaching the Colorado Rapids as well. They hired me and... Uh, you know, to be honest with you, started the academy, was with Aaron, uh, Lady Andrade. We After that amazing World Cup that she had from Colombia, uh, we, we signed her. And it was, it, was, it was a great season. I learned a lot. Uh, those, those rookies, Lynn Williams, Sam Mewis, Abby Dolkemper, Jay Hinkle, uh, they, they had, the, you know, a, a, a tough first season. Uh, but haven't they just, just become the, the world's best players, to be honest with you? Yeah, that's the thing, too, that... When they relocated to the Courage, you look at all the results that the North Carolina Courage are having now, and it's kind of that those players went over there, and it's a new badge, a new city, a new area, but, you know, a lot of that work that was put in, it's, you know, the Paul Riley is doing an amazing job with that cast, but a lot of that cast came from the Flash. So when we, when we, when I got there, it was the 15 draft, and I remember sitting there with Charlie, with, with Aaron, uh, Joe Salen, uh, 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 the owner of that Flash entity. Uh, Salen, Salen uh, packing and uh, you know ultimately we drafted uh, these 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 kids who don't get me wrong I I coached them for, against them for four years and, yeah and, and 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 Charlie had coached them from when they were young in California and and everything and ultimately uh, we drafted them and people thought we were crazy um, they had good college careers don't get me wrong they, they were good players are uh, you 23s in and out you know uh, so, so ultimately, for them to go on and have the careers they had, especially after a you know a tougher first season at the Flash, and, uh, you know I'm still in touch with some of those guys, and and they, they're just they're just unbelievable players. I I still think Abby Dolkemper is um, the best centre back, a uh, ball playing centre back, because obviously different different types of centre backs um, in 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 the country and in the world, without a doubt. She she's technical. She can hit a ball. Her free kicks. Uh, um, her ability to just uh, connect passes from the back line. Uh, she's phenomenal. Obviously, definitely other great players around her, uh, but different types of players, you know? Yeah, I mean, all the names you, you said are obviously now household names within the, the, just a the soccer scape, you know, playing for the U.S. national team. Um, just looking at what they've, you know, some of the players are still with, you know, with the same sort of thing down the courage that, you know, it, that, you know, the same thing me and you, I used to coach college, and when you're recruiting players, I think a lot of people think you want the flashy kid that wins all the awards, or everybody thinks that you want the, the Stanford kid, nothing against Stanford, but you you got a player, you find a player that fits in your system, and I'm sure that that goes into my lot of college kids, that you don't always have to go for that high school Gatorade player of the year, you, you want that player that fits your system and what you guys are doing, and sometimes you got to overlook all the accolades. Yeah, no, there's, there's a player who uh, I still believe should be in the U.S. women's national team. And I know when I say her name, uh, most of you guys will agree. Uh, I, I hope you would. There's a player that I remember. She played for me at the Colorado Rapids uh, as a youth player and then went on and played W League and scored a bucket of goals in the W League and against Charlie scored some goals. And, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, very good player. 
Kristen Hamilton, uh, who, oh, yeah. you know, she's, you know, Paul Riley loves her. Uh, every time I text him, te- uh, you know, about her, he'll, he'll, he loves her. Uh, I think I interviewed you know, her. I think I talked to her. She was part of the, I think, the victory tour here in Philadelphia. Yeah. I think, yeah. I don't think she got a cap. I think she might have got a cap later against Portugal, but I know the U.S. played Portugal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, talk I, her I, yeah I, I remember Kristen, in, 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 I remember telling her this, and uh, if she listens to this, she, she, she'll confirm it. Uh, I remember telling her she was probably 18, 19 at DU, playing for DU, with so many other good players back then. DU had a, I think they made a run in the Sweet 16 that year in the college game, and, you know, she... She, I remember she scored some goals against Tracy Kevins was the LA strikers coach, believe it or not. Tracy Kevins, who went on and currently is, um, you know, was, was with the U.S. national team in assistant roles, youth national team roles and uh, uh, scouting roles. Um, another unbelievable coach, uh, Tracy Kevins, and person too. Um, you know, so I remember uh, Kristen scoring against uh, LA strikers um, in that year when there was no, no pro league, highest tier. And, um, you know, uh, I remember telling her uh, with her in the, in, in the, in the locker room that, you know, if you really want to be a pro, you really can be yeah. just because of, in my opinion, her work ethic is unreal. The way she uh, plays games at a hundred percent is how she trains and, and how she is in her real life. Just everything she does. It's just, it's just, it's just high end professional, uh, uh, always uh, um, uh, trying to do the best. You know, Chris Hamilton, unbelievable player. No, she's great, great down there. In person. You know, yeah, no, she, she, she's one we talked about on the show before, you know, with her impact with courage and what she's done and just getting that, that call off. And that's the hardest thing with the U.S. Women's National Team is you get that call off, you got to seize that opportunity. And the player pool is so big. And you look at the players who are in front of you, you got like Lynn Williams, Jess McDonald now are emerging to be really yeah. good strikers. And with, with how long Alex Morgan can be out, we don't know. And, you know, it just, it's, it's next man up type of mentality that you, you get on that. And it's just the options are so small, you tell these players. You get that one call up the camp, take advantage. I, I hope Kristen gets more. I, I, I think she's, in, in, in just so, you, you know, firsthand, I know this. I know she's being touted by some clubs in Europe right now. Um, I, I, I know firsthand. And she's going to stay with the courage from my understanding. But she's another player who, there's some big clubs in Europe who really, Really like her. Yeah, so um, let's talk about a little about the game, the women's game. I, I'm just curious about, you know, we, we look at the NWSL's got nine clubs, and, and it's something that we've really been pushing a lot on the show, that you, you've got, you know, the European clubs that they're not going anywhere. You look at, like, Chelsea, Arsenal, and PSG, and Leon, that these are well-established clubs that aren't disappearing. And it's something that we talk about a lot on the show, that why – we want the women to stay here, but you go over to Europe, you're getting top line facilities, you know, and we, we, we've heard of stories in it, you know, in WSL that some of the facilities aren't exactly the same per club. So why, like look at, for example, Sam Curry, you know, the, the limitations that were put on her for international spot, she was making pocket change. So it's like, you know, I know Sam Curry when she played for the um, Sky Blue the season I was with them. And it's, you, you can't blame these players for going to, to a club that will still be around and can actually pay them what they're worth. You know firsthand, Charlie. You're 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 into it, and you know it, and you're up close and personal with, with with this. So for me, and, and, and I agree with you. I, I think at this point in time, uh, the league exists, and, and and they've done well to exist this far. Um, but ultimately, for for it to, you you look at like now Seattle Rain. You know, just being branded. Um, you know that connection with Leon, yeah. right? Yeah, um, you know, and, and, and that's a good thing, I think. But at the same time, are we allowing Manchester United to come out here and take over the New York Red Bulls in the MLS and be called Manchester Red Bulls? I'm just giving you an example. Yeah. I, I don't think that would fly. You know what I mean? Yeah, because um, there's rumors that Spain's getting so big in the women's game that, that even just the Spanish women's national team now can go toe-to-toe with the U.S. and hold them. And their league is growing so fast that we've seen some players just leave and just say, you know, I'm going to go over, you know, play for Barcelona, play for, you know, all the different, you know, Spanish clubs that have the teams. Because what they do is they have the facilities and they have the overhead to add the women's team is not a big financial burden upon them to add it. They've already got the infrastructure. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Infrastructure is massive. And- yeah. I still believe that, and it was when I was in Colorado with the Rapids, and, and, and when I was there, 
Um, I was lucky to become the head coach of that women's team. And we, had, you know, I, I, I had Chloe Legazzo. I had, oh, sorry, that was at the Pride uh, a little bit after, but I had Brooke Spence, who was a national team player. And, you know, we had Kristen Hamilton and, you know, we, we, we and, and, and among other, other players too, to be honest with you, that were very good players uh, back then. But to be honest with you, I, I just feel that those European clubs have a little bit more ability to use the men's facility that if, if it just existed in the past. My, my, my good friend Pedro Losa, he's the manager at, um, at Bordeaux uh, Women in, in the French Top League. And, you know, they, they get everything the men do. And, and that, that, what I mean by that is obviously not the money for salaries, but they're aspiring to do that. But at the same time, they get the same chef to cook the meals. They get the same training facility. They get the same, you know, that, that environment is, is, is great. And, and, and they deserve that. And until maybe our MLS clubs, which we, we, we know it's been discussed before really branch up. Um, you know, I, I liked the, um, Houston dynamo dash combo. I loved it because obviously, you know, you're playing in stadiums. I like the Orlando, uh, set up for, for, for the men and the women and, you know, North Carolina courage. They, they have a, a great deal of respect for that, that, uh, men's team as well and the women's team so you know sky blue i think does need to and, and and other clubs as well does need to in my opinion stop trying to do it on their own even though they do a good job um maybe they can branch on and uh, yeah, you know I, I know elise lahue's done a great job there in the sense of uh redirecting sky blue and, and I'm, I'm only bringing them up because they're local right yeah uh, there's there's many others that um still need to get to that tier of, um, you know, treating, treating the players like pros. Uh, but, but I think they're going to get there. I really do. Yeah, I think it's a big thing. I have conversations with a lot of these GMs, players, and owners about, you know, what's the difference between, uh, is this an actual real partnership or are you renting space? If you look at a lot of these NWSL teams that are renting the stadium, when you're at Western Flash, it's you guys, that's not your stadium, you know. So, but when, when you're out there renting, like, space for clubs or colleges that, at the end of the day, it's not your facility, it's not your field, so you, you, you're paying rent, rental fees. So, um, and that's another thing that goes with the conversation. I have a lot of these these young women, even in WPSL, that say, "Oh, I'm going to go play pro in in countries, this country in Europe." And I tell them, like, "Well, don't look at the money. You know, first see how they're going to take care of you." Because the cool part about the WPSL that I coach in that we can house players. You know, we, we can feed the players, we can provide them transportation, we can give them summer camps and clinics. You look at all those aspects, you're going to go somewhere pro, make a pocket change, and all your money is going to go to your food and your rent, and you're going to be bumming rides somewhere. No, you, Charlie, what you guys do with, 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 with your uh, uh, Lone Star group is, is pro. You know, you, you, you're, you, you, you're setting them up and you're trying to put them in an environment. Obviously, they're not professionals. Let's be clear about that, right? Because uh, they, 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 they can't be because you're not, you're, not, you're not attaching money and contracts to them. But they're pros in the sense of – how they treat it, and, 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 and you do a great job with that. And I agree with you. I think they're going to be treated a lot better uh, playing for a team that you're affiliated with and you're doing the, the hard work of, of, of creating that, that pro environment than they will go in and play. And I'm just going to be honest with you, some, some leagues in, in, in Iceland, I'm just going to throw that one out. And I know Iceland has great facilities and I think Iceland does a good job. But if you're going to the third tier in Iceland, that's probably not a good move. Or no, it's the same thing. Girls, like, I got, a, I got an offer from a Swedish club. Like, what, what division? What club? And it, it gets third, third tier. Yeah. You know, you're making 40 yeah. bucks a week. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. Yeah. and you're so stuck there. How do, you, how do you fly home? Your season's yeah. over and you got no money to fly home. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do a lot of that uh, player education, too. I had a, we had a good player at Villanova who graduated, didn't go in the draft. Uh, sorry, signed up, didn't get signed, uh, uh, you know, didn't get selected to the draft or, or much for uh, invites to training camps. And, she, she came and she said, you know, I, I, I really want to try Europe. And I, I explained that to her where Europe sounds great in theory, but they're still developing so much too. Unless you're really going to those top flight groups that are, uh, again, affiliated with established men's programs, um, then, then, then really it's, it's maybe a little bit of a long shot. You know what I mean? So I agree with you, man. That's why I, I, what you do and what you're trying to do is, should be attractive for the collegiate player, in my opinion, but also the player who maybe is past college and still wants to play. Yeah, we have a, we have a good mix. We have quite a few girls that, that tried out for 
some NWSL teams, and, and obviously the, the sort of situation we're now, we're all old patterns. That's one of those things. Do you, do you have some younger players too, right? you got some kids who aren't even in college, right? Yeah, we have a couple of high schoolers that we've announced on our roster, and we have a couple – majority great. of the chunk of the WBSL is college players. And then you have the post-college players that – we have some really solid women who just want to keep playing. And, and the cool part is there are women that play in these, these amateur leagues that don't want to go pro. I mean, I had – I had two players last year that some NWSL teams had to work out. One of them, they were both engineers. They're like, you know what? And, it, and it's a sad situation. We're on a women's soccer where they turn down an NWSL team because they're an engineer. It's like, I, I make more money being an engineer. And I can practice part-time, play part-time, go to NWSL and make 20000 when I'm making three times as much being an engineer. But see, this, 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 uh, this goes back to culture. And, um, you know, you watch – I'll give you an example and you'll know it as soon as I say it. The Salford City lifestyle where, yeah. you know, you're working as a plumber or you're an electrician and then, you know, three nights a week you're going to go and train uh, at night after work, um, you know, and, and, and you could be 30, you could be 35, you could be, you know, that, that, that was the Australian culture that I grew up in and the, the European model where, you know, you could still go be an engineer and yeah. work nine to five or nine to six or whatever, um, what it, whatever that entails. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with being an engineer, but I, I do believe that here, the culture, you know, and I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that I think this is an issue. Leagues should still operate and there should be a, a desire for players to want to go and play after work. And I don't see a lot of that. I see some adult leagues indoor and I, I yeah. see some awesome things like that, but we, 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 we really could be doing a better job when it comes to offering a, you know, a, a league that goes for six, seven months of the year that it's not pro, but it's a league uh, and it's localized and it's just New Jersey, PA, New York, and, 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 and you know, the surrounding states, Delaware. And, 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 and you know, you, you, it, you perform and, and you keep that going and you compete and you train three weeks a night and, uh, three three nights a week and you play a game on a weekend and you have a coach who maybe makes a little bit of money. I get it. There's some time, um, um, you know, like youth coaches right now. Like there's some decent salaries for coaching a U16 team, for example. Uh, you could pay this, that same salary to, to, to a good coach to coach a, a women's team, you know, yeah. not, not just for two months or three months over the summer. Do you see where I'm going with this? Well, that's and, the model we have. We, we train yeah. in the evening to allow all my players to work during the day. You know, and, and we practice all of our practices were after six or seven o'clock in the evening under the lights and games were all mostly weekend. You get a few weekday games you just can't avoid. And, and that's the kind of the model because all my coaching staff all have day jobs. And that's the realistic side that there's not many people in this world that can coach youth soccer or semi pro soccer and make 100 percent living. You know, well, well, that's what I'm referring to. But I, I don't think your league should go for two or three months. Let, let's put. 24 games on that ba baby and let's let's get that going over six months yeah. you know what I mean like let's let's make it a little bit more appealing and let's get I'll give you an example let's get PDA FC Bucks let's get all these you know ECNL clubs or, or whatever yeah to, senior to level for senior, the women to play senior women yeah. you know uh, and, and then that way they're not paid like, we get that uh, but at the same time um, maybe you get to the point where maybe in 10 years time you can pay them something uh, uh, yeah. You know, so I, I think the, the culture, the model right now is still um, not there yet. Uh, I'm glad we've got at the NWSL. I really am. I think we need a second tier, even though we've only got nine teams. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what gets me. The nine teams is just the amount of talent. If you do the math and let's say, let's round it up with some injured reserve, 25 players on nine teams. You're, it's only a couple hundred players that can truly in the United States of America say that they are professional female athletes. And that's just not enough from, just, you know, I could take half your Villanova. I could take just all D1 schools in Philadelphia, and we could put together a good, like, almost pro team that could, could hang with some Sky Blue teams or the Washington Spirit just based on Philadelphia D1 schools. You're absolutely right, man. You're absolutely right. It's, it's not good enough yet, and uh, they deserve more. I totally agree with you. So, no, so during this whole time, I mean, I know we're having to be creative, you know, that we're having to – do these interviews and training. Like, how's this been with you just, you know, learning to adapt as a coach? Because I've learned that my coaching license means nothing right now during the situation that we're in. No, it's, it's, it's different. And uh, to be honest with you, um, I'm learning a lot. 
uh, uh, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with anything I've done before. Uh, communication's key. So if, if you're a good communicator going into this, I don't think you're going to struggle too much. If you struggled communicating going into this, uh, then, then I don't know what you're doing. Probably not doing much at all. But uh, look, at the same time, um, I think whether you've got youth clubs, whether you're a college club, I, I, I do a little bit of both, right? So you've got to also give players time and space. And, I, and I'm a big believer of not, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, uh, be slack. I'm just saying that the, the people that we're working with, um, the, the, the athletes that we're working with, it's a shock for them. We, we, we've never experienced what we're going through in, in our lives. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 30s and, and um, you know, uh, other, other things have affected me, but not greatly in the sense of um, like, like this is. And I can only imagine the kids, right? So uh, at the same time, we, we, we've been trying to stay in touch with our players on the college front to check in and say hi. Um, as well as, you know, some guidance in some other areas. But we're not overloading them. Absolutely not. Uh, the club side, um, you know, at, here at FC Bucks, just joining of, of, of two days, I haven't got going in the, the sense of what other clubs are doing. I know some other clubs are doing a phenomenal job. Um, I know you're doing a phenomenal job with your groups. And yeah, I think you can definitely still uh, help players get better. Um, but, uh, you know, there's an avenue I'm going to try here and I want to, I want to speak about this because I think it's important is, um, maybe this is a time for us to, um, look at, you know, as adults, we see, you know, how to be a better coach, uh, how to be a better, uh, uh, father, how to be a better husband, how to, so then you read these books or you listen to these, uh, uh, you know, uh, things on the radio or, or podcasts, but I think for these players right now, what, like what you're doing, you're, you're bringing in players or elite coaches or, or people that can maybe connect with them and, and answer some questions. I think that's the type of education that right now, and, until we get out of it, hopefully sooner than later, you can't keep doing this forever. But I think that sort of stuff, Charlie, that, that, that you've started doing, I know we at Bucks, I, I really am going to take an active role on that. I'd love to get a, a, a pro athlete to speak to a, an ECNL group or a, yeah. a, a, a pro coach to speak to a, 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 a young U10 group and the parents because maybe the parents need to be educated just as much. But realistically, I think that's an area that we, we, we should actually be focusing on. Um, and I think the kids need to have conversations with people other than us. You know what I mean? It yes. could even be doctors in the COVID crisis, right? Yeah. Just, 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 they need to educate themselves in other ways, you know? Yeah, we're, we're such a lifestyle, you and I, that it's go, 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 go. And it's just, it's, 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 it's interesting to not be in the car driving to and from the session. The thing that's my players is, is you can dial it back. And this, this is the time where I, I joke with my players. I'm like, dude, you can eat donuts now. I won't care. I'm not going to hold it. Absolutely. <laughs> you can be a yeah. fatty now and eat up and enjoy. And, and it's just, if you get your touches in, great. If you don't, not a big deal you know do what makes you happy right now if you want to watch some soccer documentaries go do that if you want to read about soccer write about soccer this is that time to explore your love of the game and i was like coach telling you touches 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 because if you get them great if not i'm not going to hold it against you <laughs> to to totally agree with you totally agree with you now so um, want to also thank you know I know that your your wife is actually working the front line so I want to you know thank her from our show to you that you're holding it down like me at home with the kids you know it's, it's <laughs> the whole new thing we're getting used to man <laughs> no she, the front line she's uh, she's got to deal with me at home now that's a front line she's dealing with uh, uh, it's uh, she, bless her soul probably like your wife or all the wives out there and all the husbands out there that you know uh, uh, having to deal with having, having those, the, you know, the partners at home and uh, it's not easy. You're right. But uh, no, she's, she's, she's great. She's great. Thank you, Charlie, for saying that. And your wife as well, mate, to, to, to uh, be at home and, and, and put up with you, I think is, uh, is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to get over with That's, that's a whole, I've got a bunch of friends. We got a survivor poll that we're doing. Too. First man out alive. <laughs> right. You're right. I want to thank you for coming on World Sports Show. I appreciate everything you do and anything you need from us. We definitely, let's keep the conversation going. 
you know, about, you know, these, these programs, because this is the time where we're all picking each other's brains. There's no really wrong thing to do when it comes to these meetings. No, it's been a pleasure, Charlie. Thank you for having me, man. You're, you're top class. Uh, thank you so much, man.